Today, I have a pleasure of speaking to Robin Anier. Robin is an Australian writer. She wrote a number of historical books, for many of which she took inspiration from her hometown of Melbourne. So I'm very excited to talk to Robin today about the early days of Melbourne, about the gold rush period, which affected the trajectory of the city, the rivalry between Melbourne and Sydney, and my favorite part, Robin's recommended walks and her favorite hidden gems in Melbourne. So let's get started. Robin, welcome to Travel Zoom. Thank you, Aga. Pleasure to be here. I'd like to, I'd like to start by asking you to describe Melbourne in a few sentences or adjectives to someone who is not familiar with the place. Um, I would say it's a down-to-earth kind of city. It's not, I don't think of it as glitzy. Um, it's a great walking city because it's not too hilly. Um, and the main thing to say about it is that it's not Sydney, which describes it <laughs> um, in opposition to its rival. Right, that's that's a good one. So let's talk about the early days of Melbourne as a city. So before the first settlers arrived, I think what has to be said that for uh, for tens of thousands of years, the indigenous people had been living on the land. That's one. And secondly, that actually there were other colonies already in Australia around Sydney, today's Sydney and, and Hobart. I was hoping, Robin, that you can help us set the historical scene around the founding of the first settlement on the Yarra River. So Melbourne was pretty much positioned halfway, or the site of Melbourne, what would become Melbourne, and it was a, a port uh, on the coast called Port Phillip or up the river. So this was positioned kind of midway between Sydney and the convict settlement there and Van Diemen's Land, where Hobart is, today's Tasmania. It was kind of halfway between those. It was the southern part of the colony of New South Wales, the convict colony of New South Wales, where Sydney is the capital. Um, now, it was uninhabited by white settlers. As you say, Indigenous people had been living on the land uh, and connect, had a strong connection with the country around Melbourne and Victoria for tens of thousands of years. Now, what happened was a, 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 an essentially commercial push on the part of some sheep farmers in the northern part of Van Diemen's Land or Tasmania to want to expand their land holdings because Tasmania is a very small island and they themselves were penned in. They couldn't grow any bigger. So um, a partnership of, uh, of squatters or sheep farmers from the north of Tasmania uh, basically risked a rogue settlement or a rogue land grab. So they went across Bass Strait, the body of water that separates um, Van Diemen's Land from Port Phillip, and went up the river and um, decided on a place for a village, which did in fact become the future site of Melbourne, and did something interesting. You see, the lands in the, in the eyes of the people who were administering those lands, the people in Sydney, the colonial administrators, these lands belonged to the king. They were crown lands. And because it was such a distance from Sydney, they didn't want those lands to be settled yet. They weren't ready to, they didn't have any administrators on the spot. They couldn't police the lands and the settlement of them. So they weren't ready for that to happen yet. So this was an illegal settlement. John Batman um, from Northern Tasmania and his partners went up the river, met with uh, a group of Indigenous men and singled out those they thought were the, um, were the chiefs and had them make a mark on, make their mark, their signature, if you like, on a contract or a treaty in which, in return for the lands, all the lands around about Melbourne for running sheep on, they would provide some tools, some provisions and food, um, clothing. And, uh, and other sorts of supplies, uh, sort of in an ongoing way. And this was kind of novel because uh, as, far as, as far as I know, this hadn't been tried before. And it was trying to go around the colonial administrators and make this uh, a settlement before the people in Sydney knew that it was happening. So Melbourne was a fact, if you like, the, the, the germ of Melbourne was a fact before the people in Sydney 
even knew about it. Um, and John Batman and his partners and others who followed on from them began that settlement on the Yarra River in the place Batman had said looked like the best place for a village. Right. Thank, thanks for that. I was actually about to ask you about John Batman. You you have uh, written a book called Berbras, and in the chapter Shapers and Founders, you, you do talk about uh, various key figures in the early days of Melbourne, uh, one being John Batman. So I wanted to ask you, first of all, to explain the title of the book, if you can. And uh, you mentioned the treaty, and, and I know it's been relatively controversial how much the in, uh, indigenous people actually knew about what they're signing. So if you can talk a little bit about that too. So my first book um, about the history of early Melbourne before the gold rushes, so these very formative years of the settlement, was called Bear Brass. And Bear Brass was one of a whole handful of names that were tried out for that early settlement before officialdom came and stamped a good British name, the name of the British Prime Minister, Melbourne, on it. So before that time, uh, there was uh, the idea of Batmania, named after John Batman, uh, one of the principal settlers, which, you know, there would have been fantastic uh, licensing um, <laughs> uh, possibilities for that today, but nobody had that much foresight. So Batmania was ruled out. Um, but there were various mishearings um, of... Um, of the, um, of the indigenous name uh, of the river itself, um, Birrarung. Um, and it was misheard as things like bear heap, bear port, uh, bear burp, uh, and bear brass, which was the most common mishearing. Um, so bear brass was one of the names that was bandied around and that that earliest, most pre-Melbourne settlement was known by. And I wanted to capture the spirit of that. Um, by naming, naming, giving that name to my book. Um, John Batman, as I say, Batmania, as it almost was, was the, was the settler who was most commonly credited uh, with the title of pioneer because he was the one who first sailed up the Yarra River, said this will be the place for a village and uh, presented the uh, Indigenous chiefs, as he identified them, um, with his contract or treaty which offered them in return for the lands um, various goods and, and, uh, and provisions in an ongoing sort of way. Now, you know, the, 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 these chiefs, as he thought they were, um, made their marks on this treaty. And who's to say whether they knew uh, what they were exchanging um, what they were giving in exchange? Probably not, not because, just because it wasn't a concept, I don't think, that was uh, that would have been familiar to them. The idea of giving giving these lands away, because you know, as as far as I know, the indigenous concept of connection to the land is not really one of ownership. Um, it's it's you know of using the earth's resources, and and I think John Batman and his partners' idea of using those resources and and um, and valuing them, and even finding you know spiritual value in them. Um, I think was very different. I mean, they wanted to run their sheep on the land and uh, and have Melbourne as a provisioning centre, if you like, as a commercial and provisioning centre for this this new farming land. So um, that exchange happened, and uh, and the contract was quickly overruled by the the administrators, the colonial administrators in Sydney, who said, no, no, this cannot be. These are crown lands and we will administer them and we will send our people there. So in very short time, they sent their own magistrates and police and administrators and their own, their own, their own name, of course, the name of Melbourne. Um, so it was very soon began to be, it very soon began to be tamed and given um, a British colonial shape. An interesting idea to imagine um, is what kind of shape it would have taken had John Batman and the Vandemonian settlers developed it along their own lines and how the relationships with Indigenous people might have developed from there. But as I say, that treaty was off. So um, we will never know how that might have happened in an alternative history of Melbourne. Thanks, Robin, for explaining it in such a succinct and clear way. That's definitely helpful. Let's uh, let's move on to the mid of the 19th century. So that's the gold rush period. And in your other book, 
nothing but gold, the diggers of 1852, you describe lives of people and, and families that um, search for gold, so their daily struggles. In fact, your great great grandmother and her family were some of those people. But what I was hoping you can explain is in the context of the gold rush boom, the city has changed so, so fast from transforming from an agricultural town into the mega city very, very quickly. And uh, can you just talk a little bit about that impact of, of gold rush and um, ju just that period? The most obvious impact of the gold rush on Melbourne was that Melbourne grew and became a much wealthier and much more viable city. It had been hard to attract immigrants to the bottom of the world, free immigrants to this bottom of the world settlement, um, because of course it, it was proudly not a convict colony, but getting free settlers to come there had been difficult. It wasn't a big draw card. Suddenly, of course, there was gold. The best thing about it was that gold was discovered something like a week after Victoria, that's the colony that formed around Melbourne, separated from New South Wales uh, that Sydney was the capital of. So the gold, if you like, was all ours. It was Victorian gold and Melbourne gold. So that was important. Um, but so there was there was the wealth and there was the, the size of the population that was drawn there. Tens of thousands of, um, of immigrants came from other colonies in, in Australia and then, of course, from overseas, mainly from Europe, but from all over the world over the next 10 years. But in that first year or two, it was just an explosion. Um, there was the wealth, as I say. You could make, your fortunes could change in an afternoon because, as they said in those earliest days, there was gold dangling in the grass roots. You could pull up grass and find nuggets of gold in the roots. So that you can imagine how that could change the, the tra trajectory of an individual's life and the life of their future generations. And that, that certainly happened. So not everyone struck it rich. But what the bigger change was, I think, for Melbourne and for Victoria that was caused by gold was the social impact because they were principally uh, working people who came, um, often educated tradespeople and labourers from the northern manufacturing towns of, um, of England who were self, were, if they weren't self-educated, they were interested in, in educating themselves. So they were, um, they were seizing new ideas and many of them had come here with ideas of uh, a more democratic way of life and governing already implanted in them from the sorts of movements, uh, the Chartist movement and so on that were happening in Britain at that time and from trade unions that were, were just forming and, uh, and so on. So they could see their for the potential for their fortunes to change even without finding gold. But in the, the strict social hierarchy of Britain, they and their descendants were potentially going to be not exactly serfs, but someone's almost indentured employees forever, as far as they could see. Here on the gold fields, they quickly became their own boss, immediately were their own boss, or they worked in a small partnership where everything was shared equally, the profits as well as the labour. And that independence, that the independence of their working lives and the, the freedom they had of being in the bush, being able to um, hunt, which again, they couldn't do in Britain because the lands and the animals on them all belonged to some wealthy man. This very much changed their outlook and their prospects and how they saw the potential for their life unfolding. So democratic ideas of votes for all men, um, an eight hour working day, um, the secret ballot so that you didn't hold up your hand and everybody knew who you voted for and you had to vote like your boss wanted you to. These ideas um, soon became a reality in Victoria, much sooner than they did almost anywhere else in the world and certainly a long time ahead of um, England. And the gold rush and the people that it attracted um, and the way of life they found themselves living was a huge contributor to that. So that very soon we had um, governments composed of uh, a good number of working working men who, you know, started their lives in, in very humble um, capacities and came out here and before they knew it, they were 
they were the leaders of the community and uh, were making laws that uh, made Victoria, as they said, um, uh, a laboratory for democracy. Most people would have heard of Melbourne and Sydney uh, outside everywhere globally, but um, a lot of people are puzzled how the little-known Canberra is the capital city of Australia. And from what I understand, it is this historical rivalry between both cities that actually was the reason that neither of the cities was was um, chosen as the capital city of Australia. Robin, what, what can you tell us about this rivalry? <laughs> um, Australia's capital, Canberra, is decidedly a compromise um, between Melbourne and Sydney. So it's situated almost exactly halfway between those two rivalrous cities, but uh, it's in New South Wales, which is Sydney's colony, if you like, Sydney's state. Um, so this, um, this came to be because at the time of federation, when all the colonies became one nation in uh, uh, 1901, in the lead up to that, New South Wales and the people of Sydney were pretty reluctant compared to Victorians to, to join the federation. They weren't really that keen. So as a sweetener, um, it was offered not for Sydney to have the capital, but for the capital to be in New South Wales. And this was to encourage more Sydney people and New South Wales people to vote for it. They definitely wouldn't have if the capital was going to be in Melbourne. In fact, Melbourne was the capital of Australia for the first um, 26 years while Canberra was built. Um, so we, we had, you know, our moment in the sun as the capital of Australia. That's a, that's a great story. Uh, my last question, Robin. So your next book, As Adrift in Melbourne, is coming out this December. Congratulations. It contains a series of walks in Melbourne, stories of buildings and people who used to live in those buildings. Uh, so Robin, can I ask you to be our city guide for a few minutes and just take us uh, through a short walk and, and some hidden gems in the city that, that you'd recommend? The sort, of, uh, the sort of gems that I talk about on my walks are very hidden, Aga, because most of them are places and certainly people that have disappeared. But there's not a lot to see in, on my walks. You just have to do a lot of imagining. So one of my favourite places, and it's right in the heart of the city, almost opposite the Melbourne Town Hall, so right at the hub of the city, is a little network of um, laneways and... Um, and arcades called Howie Place. And Howie Place, it's changed names over the years. It's a, it's a laneway that became an arcade because in the early 20th century, um, a shopkeeper nearby built a glass roof over the top. Um, and there are many little threaded threads of lanes leading off it um, in all directions. And I, in my book, take a walk along here and uh, look at and consider some of the things that have happened there and that are still there to see. Um, the magnificent uh, Manchester Unity Building, which is an Art Deco um, skyscraper opposite the Melbourne Town Hall, its little arcade that leads through it feeds into Howie Court, Howie Court, so um, Howie Place. So the Manchester Unity Arcade has in it uh, such gems as Melbourne's first escalator. Um, which they called a magic stairway when it opened. And it only goes up. You have to go down the stairs. There is no down escalator. And on the first day it opened in 1932, in the, in the depths of the Depression, when there was so little to entertain people, thousands, thousands of people rode on this short escalator in the first day and then ran downstairs and got back on it again. It was just, you know, it was just the life of the party. So that's still there. And there's a little cafe in um, Manchester Unity Arcade in an old switchboard cupboard. It's one of the tiniest cafes um, you'd come across anywhere. And I, I do love that, the switchboard cafe. And Howie Place itself just has so many stories hanging off it that I tell of the first, uh, the first hairdressing salon where um, permanent waves were done in Melbourne. Again, that was incredibly popular and, and, and people thronged there. There was a jazz club. A, quite a secret jazz club during the 1920s called the Corona Club, um, which is quite topical, um, where, you know, um, 
uh, all the black bottom dances and the rest of it used to be taught and it was only open after hours and was quite secret. Um, and there was even a place, a building there where um, the Housewives Association used to meet. Um, and in the years after the Second World War, when the price of gas, among other things, skyrocketed, um, the housewives on one occasion rioted and the police had to be called in um, to control the rioting housewives who were angry um, at the price of gas. And all this happened and many more things in this small, um, this small arcade. And I tell those stories and many more and it's just, it, it's a beautiful place and very atmospheric. Even if you knew none of the stories, you would get a sense that lots of things had happened there. Sounds very intriguing. Yes, we look look forward to that to that book. Robin, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing uh, some stories uh, with us. Well, I wish you all the very best with the uh, launch of the book. Uh, I'm sure that will keep you pretty busy, and uh, we look forward to many more. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye.